Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Melvin Edwards and Massimiliano Gioni. This program is one of over a dozen artist conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Research and Residencies Council, and New Museum digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters, like you, who help make these programs possible. I'll now share brief notes about this program's featured artist. Melvin Edwards is a pioneer in the history of contemporary American art and sculpture. Edwards' practice reflects his engagement with histories of race, labor, and violence, as well as with themes of the African diaspora. His work has been exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally. Recent exhibitions include the 2015 retrospective Melvin Edwards, Five Decades, at the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas, which then traveled to the Zimmerle Museum of Art at Rutgers and the Columbus Museum of Art. Other recent solo exhibitions include Melvin Edwards, Festivals, Funerals, and New Life at Brown University in 2017, Melvin Edwards Lynch Fragments at Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2018, and Melvin Edwards Crossroads at the Baltimore Museum of Art in 2019, which then traveled to the Odgen Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans in 2020. Edwards' work has been featured in many group exhibitions, including Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, which originated at the Tate Modern in London, Post-War, Art Between the Pacific and the Atlantic, 1945 to 1965, at Haus der Kunst in Munich, and the 56th Venice Biennale. Edwards' work is represented in the collections of the Albright Knox Art Gallery, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, among many others. Now, a few logistical notes. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located on the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to the New Museum's Edlis Neeson Artistic Director, Massimiliano Cioni. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you again to the great education department that has also become a broadcasting department. And it's so great to be here again with all of you and with our friends at home. Uh, Melvin, uh, if you wanna turn on the camera and the sound. Are we on? There you are. Okay. So welcome Melvin. Today <clears throat> we are really privileged to be in the presence of history and in the presence of art world royalty with you. And uh, mm -hmm. we missed you last time. And, and so it's twice as much uh, pleasure and honor to, to have you tonight. And um, I wanna start this conversation by asking the question I've asked uh, all the participating artists in the show, which is how and when did you meet Okwi and Wetzel? Um, I'm not sure the exact year, but it was at Skoto Gallery many years ago when it was down on Prince Street. And um, I think I was visiting. I didn't live that far from, uh, uh, in fact, I lived at Prince and Avenue of the Americas. And of course they were closer to uh, Bowery and Prince, I think. But in any case, that's where we met. And I think because I'd had uh, significant contact with 
uh, people in Nigeria, and uh, in particular, in fact, his ethnic group. Uh, a very good friend of mine is the architect Demas Nwoko, and we had worked together in Nigeria. So it was easy for us to, if you will, talk and that sort of thing. But in a funny way, we didn't see much of each other through the years. Uh, you know, we heard about each other and he probably more than me because, you know, that's the way curators live. <laughs> but um, uh, always it was interesting. And uh, when I got to see him in Venice uh, and then after, I think last time I saw him was in, in London and it's a breakfast uh, at a hotel and he was having uh, breakfast with a niece and he was proud of her because she had just graduated uh, from, uh, I guess, a higher level of education. And, uh, but Okwe was always very um, easy to talk to, you know, and he seemed to already have understood things. You didn't have to explain things to him as you often did to others. Mm -hmm. And he, he presented your work both in the Venice Biennale in 2015 and also in the, in the exhibition post-war, I believe, no? At the house that- uh, He did, uh, although I wasn't as aware of the post-war exhibition, uh, my presence in it until later, in fact. Uh, but uh, that was, and it was an interesting surprise to see it. But I think I just may have been away at the time he was doing things, you know, in the gallery. Uh, took care of that part. Yeah. So in, in the exhibition, we uh, present a group of your celebrated and, and much discussed lynch fragments. And maybe we can see some of the images of, uh, of the installation. And uh, uh, Okwi himself had chosen and presented a few in, in the beginning of the Arsenal in his uh, uh, Venice uh, Biennale in 2015. Uh, the inclusion, I think, in, in Grief and Grievance is also particularly interesting because one of the subtext in the exhibition is the, the conversation around uh, abstraction and political content. And in a sense, when you started making these works in 1963, uh, the way in which you took on the tradition of modern and modernist sculpture and, and combine it with uh, a reflection on current events and, and political content, it was a certainly a very new idea, an idea that, that was also polemical at that point. So I want to ask you a little bit about how this series has started. And I know you, you've spoken often about it, but it's such a, a central um, series for, for the history of American art. And maybe Derek, we can go through the couple of images as, as Melvin speaks. Well, um, uh, you know, my most of my education was as a painter. And um, I had evolved a lot of thinking in a lot of ways, uh, you know, with the uh, typical uh, beginning realistic realism as a study and then evolving to various ideas about abstraction. Um, where I went to school in Southern California, Los Angeles City College, uh, the University of Southern California and uh, Los Angeles County Art Institute that was only six months there, but um, uh, you could say uh, I developed my own independent way of thinking because I read a lot and read history. And as um, the arguments of abstraction and realism, uh, to me, it seemed it was already over. You could do anything you wanted. And the main thing about modern art, which was made clear uh, the early 20th century is you could invent any way of doing or thinking. It was just a matter of making it your own and, con and whatever your ideas uh, be, uh, shall we say, understandable or if not understandable, at least convincing. And uh, as far as abstraction and realism, uh, most people think if they don't know what it is, it's abstract and they don't really uh, go into what the term uh, in the deeper sense means, which means to develop from. It can develop from uh, your concepts or it can develop from other imagery or other aspects of reality, or just simply your own thinking develops uh, or changes, if you will, or evolves. In other words, it's an evolution and all art is real. 
<laughs> That's just the way it is. But I like to say, if, if you say everything is also abstract, then I'd say the only way you make anything real is to make a baby. Everything else is artificial. <laughs> now, when, you, when your thinking goes uh, bouncing off the walls in no, that many directions, you can pretty much do what you want. And uh, I was uh, not that interested in sculpture. I mean, I appreciated it, but, but when it came to uh, seeing a couple of graduate students welding in the years when almost nobody was doing that, I got interested and I got a graduate student to uh, teach me uh, to weld and he laid out six pieces of steel showed me in a rudimentary way how to join them and then said, don't bother me because I'm working on my, he's working on his uh, graduate exhibition. So basically uh, much of my dynamics have been uh, self-taught or self-discovery and experiments. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I liked was anyway, was the idea of experimenting, of not where, knowing necessarily where I'm going and to find a way. Mm -hmm. And often I'd find something that was unusual um, uh, in comparison to what I was seeing. I didn't look a lot at sculpture early on. So I wasn't that aware. Everybody knew about David Smith, but he wasn't in the, in the books in the education that you got from 1955 to 60. Um, <clears throat> and while it looks like a, I didn't graduate until 1965, um, which is true in terms of the paper, but I had stopped studying art in 1960 itself. So um, I had five years of free play or free invention. And in that period, um, the idea that you could, uh, if you will, experiment with anything, in other words, um, uh, the rhetoric art for art's sake, which I guess Clement Greenberg that was uh, responsible for, so they say. And I immediately felt when I heard the uh, discussion that no art had been made historically for any kind of sense or reason that human beings wanted. And art was just like language. How many languages have human beings invented? And therefore, how many possibilities are there for me as an artist to find something that, uh, is, if you will, expresses what I'm interested in? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you know, um, in the kind of work that I do, there are recognizable objects, but I would say the, uh, the whole conception and uh, set of processes, it's very much like experimental music, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but, uh, it's three-dimensional or it's, it's object. And primarily my material is steel. Steel uh, along with paper and plastics is probably the most common uh, materials on earth except for earth itself. Yeah. You know? And so uh, uh, it's a natural. Uh, and uh, when you actually, maybe we can look at the next image which is the the first Lynch fragment from 63 that it's called Some Bright Morning. <clears throat> May I ask you, first of all, do you always use a found object in, in the process of the Lynch fragments or was it a combination of found and, and sculpted or, or made? And, uh, and then the second question is if you can tell us a little more about this foundational piece that, that begins the whole series, which continues until today, no? Mm -hmm. um, found objects, I would say I find pieces of steel. And um, uh, sometimes, you know, something looks like a hammer that was found and it, you don't know it, but I know that I made it, you know. So in other words, uh, it's the what it looks like, and what it was, are not necessarily uh, consistent. Um, but in any case, um, the, the, the rhetorical discussion found object well, yes, some of some things are fine, found. In, in fact, uh, uh, going out to dinner with a lady, and you you step off the curb in the gutter, you see a nice little piece of steel 
<laughs> they're embarrassed that this dressed up man would pick up a piece of steel and put it in his pocket. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it gives a thought, why not? In the case of this piece, uh, Some Bright Morning, and also titles come afterwards. So the works are not illustrations of their titles, you know. Um, the, the, the title, uh, Some Bright Morning, um, came uh, well after the piece was finished, and, uh, but it, was, uh, it came from some reading I was doing. I read a lot and always do, uh, but it had to do with uh, some Afro-American history in a community in Florida who had been threatened uh, because they were too militant for the uh, white people in the vicinity and the white people threatened them and saying that if they didn't behave uh, some bright morning, they were gonna come after them. Well, that morning came, but uh, this black community was prepared for the struggle that ensued and they did not lose, you know? So, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And they said some bright morning were coming after you. Well, that bright morning got bright, but on the side of the oppressed. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. which is also, a you know, the, the, too often, in a sense, the lynch fragments are seen as tools of oppression, but I think this foundational piece suggests, as you have written, that there are weapons of freedom, not weapons of self-defense, uh, which I think lends a, a, a much more complicated reading of those objects, not just as tools of torture, but actually tools of uh, liberation and independence and, uh, and freedom. And I know you made this series also throughout the years. You made it also at the time of the Vietnam War. Uh, how do you find uh, the desire to return to it and how has it evolved? And maybe we can take a look again. Well, the earliest uh, piece we have in the show, which is Texali. <clears throat> yeah. Um, First of all, um, the works are always experimental. In other words, I don't draw or prepare an idea and then execute it. I, I literally work um, uh, directly in response to my thoughts and uh, you know concepts. The uh, so that uh, you could say. The, the, well, the reason I collectively titled them after maybe seven or eight lynch fragments were done, the lynch fragments, was because I didn't want them to be limited to the kind of uh, schoolish interpretations that people had, the limitations of, you know, it, it had to be come from this academic direction or another, and rather than it was, no, my experiment with sculpture and uh, it's, but it's also dealing with my heritage, my condition and um, in multiple ways. I mean, uh, I was listening to experimental music, you know, uh, the most advanced of the uh, jazz composers, but I was, you know, listening to uh, Anton Webern and, uh, you know, just all kinds of music. Uh, uh, um, you know, I was, I went more to foreign movies than to American movies, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, um, I don't know, I guess you could say I had, a, there's a worldview inside of all of this. And what I think people don't understand is to say um, uh, African American, uh, or to say, as some people say, the black arts movement, if you take the broader significance of, a, of statements like that, that goes back, uh, what, 500,000 years? I don't know. You know, in other words, artists uh, um, dealt with abstraction and figuration from the, the earliest things we find in the caves of human beings and symbolism and those kind of things. So the, the pyramid kind of form on this piece, Texcali, well, um, I had uh, went to Mexico in 1960. Uh, I was very aware of Mexican art in the historical sense, the Maya, the Aztecs and that sort of thing. 
I'm from Texas, you know, I'm a Tejano Negro, if you will. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the one year I was on the pyramid in Teotihuacan, the next year I was in Egypt and on the pyramid there, you see. So in other words, and this little pyramid, which is on this piece, if you will, is actually a found object. It's the, the an old automobile jack base. <laughs> they don't make them like that anymore, so I can't find any. <laughs> but uh, what I'm getting at is to be pyramidal in the middle of this uh, cultivator circle is uh, a significant contrast and yet complementary inside of my thinking. I don't expect people to uh, perceive or know all of those things that go in and the thinkings is often very momentary, very, very uh, of the moment, you know, I mean, uh, a three minute composition of music and a um, four day uh, creation of one of these works, you know, uh, well, that's uh, for me comparative. I don't know if I got to your uh, question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I wanna ask you, and, and obviously this is a question that it's too big even for a conversation tonight, but you mentioned the Black Arts Movement and, and Oqui, in his selection of, uh, of artists for grief and grievance um, was very deliberate in including the work of Jack Whitten, the work of Daniel LaRue Johnson, your work. Um, the three of you were in dialogue also early on in, in the 60s. And mm -hmm. um, in a sense, your position was, uh, uh, I don't know if it's right to, to call it polemical in relation to that of the Black Arts Movement in the sense that you revendicated the ability and the possibility to make abstract art and yet be political. Um, and so I'm curious, I, I think you hinted at it, but if you could maybe uh, capture for us the dialogue in, in that moment, and if it was really an opposition, if you felt uh, a pressure on, uh, on making art uh, with a message, with a content, you wrote also beautifully in, in those years about how black uh, art gets uh, understood to be functional, you say? Um, mm -hmm. And that felt to you as a limitation, if I understand correctly what, what you were saying. Yes and no. Um, mm -hmm. Functional in that if it's truly understood, there's something to get from the work, you know, which you won't get anywhere else but from art, you know. And uh, at the same time, um, functional in that um, you know, communities grow, societies grow. They don't just uh, become what they are. If we say Egypt, people are really thinking of the Egypt that was great and was at its apex. If we say Greece, the same thing. If you say Benin in Nigeria, you know, it, it had its period uh, of greatness, you know. And in fact, it continues today, just like there's a Queen of England, there's the Oba of Benin, you know, who I incidentally uh, actually attended Rutgers University when I was uh, uh, teaching there. That is the present Oba, you know, his father was the Oba then. But what I'm getting at is there's continuity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are things to be learned uh, uh, in anything that you do. In terms of Jack Whitten, and Danny Johnson. Danny, I knew the longest because we met in 1958 in the six months I was at Los Angeles County Art Institute, which people now know as Otis Parsons. Uh, Danny was at Chenard and uh, he came over one day to see one of his old schoolmates and we met. And uh, we didn't become uh, friends or associates until three or four years later when I'd left school and he had finished school. And then we became uh, fellow young artists. And Danny was very interested in, um, if you will, making a statement on the dynamics of the time uh, uh, in terms of race and politics. Uh, but um, I always had little bits. I, don't, I never made it a, a, would you say, a cause within the work, you know? In fact, I'd say, as a younger person, I was experimenting all over the place, 
trying to find a voice, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, but anyway, um, and uh, Danny's work that's in your collection uh, in the exhibition, I remember that period very well. Um, the story uh, you tell about him uh, traveling the country and picking up objects, well, that's not exactly true. I know because I was on the trip with him. <laughs> I, have a, I have a scrapbook of our photographs in Tucson and Houston. And, uh, but I was from the South and we took this train trip. Uh, and when we uh, got to Houston, I stayed three days in Houston and he went on to Atlanta because I hadn't seen my family in Houston in uh, three or four years. So it was a reunion for me in that respect. And he, he, Danny was more concerned at how hot and humid Houston was. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed, you know, but we, I rejoined with him in Atlanta and then we took the train on to Washington and then to New York. The, the dual reason for the trip was Danny had actually won a, a grant from the Whitney Foundation and he was going to pick up his money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to see if there was a way I could get me one of those grants too. Uh, you know, that was a part of it. But no, the seeing of the country um, in the experiences we had were interesting because it was right in the period when uh, uh, train transportation integrated, you see. In the earlier uh, years, when I went from Houston to Los Angeles to live, uh, the train was segregated from Houston to El Paso. And then at El Paso, you could change seating and you could sit anywhere. And then when you were riding the train back the other way from Los Angeles, say to Houston and New Orleans, well, it was free seating until you got to El Paso and then you had to segregate, you know. So th those are the realities of that period of history, you know. And those things like that were learned, uh, learning more for Danny than for me, uh, because he grew up uh, uh, in California, which didn't have that. But I had also lived five years in Dayton, Ohio from age seven to 12. So I had lived in the North and I understood the North and it's, shall we say, uh, integration, but with racial problems, you know. So, um, you know, it's a complicated uh, set of dynamics. And uh, when I was in Texas, no, I uh, went to a very good high school, went to, uh, uh, had a very good education. It was the same school that my parents went to. That's the South. Well, Jack Whitten, Jack was also from the South. Jack was from Alabama, from Bessemer. And we had very similar understandings of life in the South. And yet he had moved uh, to New York. And so it was a lot for us always to talk about in those terms. And at the same time, talk about, well, where do you go with art knowing what you know about the world? You know, And uh, uh, I think each of us understood no, you could say what you wanted to say, but it was a matter of doing it in a manner that was your own, unique, and hopefully uh, dynamically interesting, uh, you know, to the world of people who might appreciate art. <laughs> but if they didn't, um, I frankly was too young to care. I never thought of art as a way to make a living. I thought uh, art was a way to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than uh, the reading of books uh, on art, uh, you know, world history and art, uh, here were most of the people in the world were from China in terms of the largest country in the world and population wise, and they weren't in not one art history book when I grew up, <laughs> not one art history book had, you know, here's a quarter of the world's population. So clearly they are, you know, inaccuracies, you know, at best. You yeah. know? Uh, but it allowed me uh, in my, I guess, the kind of thinking I was developing to see that, well, there is what you can see about the world. There is what the world chooses to present to you. And then reality has some of all of that, mm -hmm. you know. 
So what's the limit in terms of making art? And, you know, there had already been Dada, <laughs> you know, there had already been Cubism, there had already been Impressionism, you know. Um, when I was in high school in Texas uh, in, in the 50s, the movie Moulin Rouge, which was uh, Toulouse Lautrec, I used to take my drawing book and I went to the theater time after time. And I, I thought when I really grew up, I would uh, be in Paris and I'd be uh, doing paintings of naked ladies kicking at the Moulin Rouge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I want to ask you something that is interesting also in, in relation to Alquis trajectory, because um, I think in 1970, instead of going to, to France, you went to Africa, no? and uh, you were speaking about China um, in 71, in, in this wonderful text, you say, we must take ideas from Brazil, Jamaica, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Trinidad, the Philippines. So you had a very global outlook um, early on in your career and, uh, and you were traveling uh, internationally. I'm curious uh, how that experience was and, and how he had an impact on your work and, and where did this uh, thirst for uh, a global dialogue came from? Um, I suppose it was from childhood reading and books. Uh, my mother read a lot and, uh, you know, books were part of it. My father uh, for a, a, a period was a, a executive for the Boy Scouts. And so there were uh, books on the history of, you know, the Boy Scouts and uh, in those histories, uh, uh, the Boy Scouts evolved out of the English experience in South Africa. And in these books were illustrations of Zulu and other peoples, you know, from that. And also uh, because the Boy Scouts uh, emphasizes handicraft and, uh, and outdoorsing, uh, uh, the Native American peoples of the uh, Americas were also a part of that uh, kind of thing. So I learned, I, I tried to make tomahawks. Um, I read a book on uh, bronze, uh, on a boy who was lost, I think in off the English or French coast named Brand, and the book was called Brand the Bronze Smith. But I was about 10 or 11 years old and it had an example of how you cast bronze to, for a weapon. Well, I remember that to this day. I remember that that book and how that fit into bronze casting when I formally learned about it. Now, when I went to Africa for the first time, 1970, that of course was uh, just a corroboration of everything. You know, in the first place, my the Africans I met who were my generation, they were uh, uh, decolonizing, getting their independence for the first time. And they had uh, ideas of how they could create their countries in new ways and stuff. And, uh, you know, and in some ways they did. I met Demas and Woko, the uh, young architect who was maybe a year my senior. And uh, on my second and third trips, uh, I worked with him. He asked me to do uh, little things related to metal work uh, uh, either in doing or advising his workers. And to this day, we are in touch, you know, and there are major books on him and his uh, architecture. And he differently than uh, the African architects you're apt to hear about, um, um, he decided not to do his work in Europe, but to stay in Nigeria and make his contribution within the country because that was a part of that original idea, if you will, ideal, but to help to reinvent their societies, mm -hmm. especially since most African countries uh, contain within them really three or four different uh, significant societies, you know, places that had been independent kingdoms before. And they're now say, they're probably, Nigeria could have six countries uh, and they would all, you know, be, could be functional. Um, anyway, um, no, Africa was just a corroboration, you know, I mean, uh, um, when I wrote back to my mother or my family, you know, uh, about those things, they were just uh, 
very pleased, you know, and when I showed slides to my father, he laughed and said, oh, you found a bunch of relatives, huh? <laughs> you know? And, you know, and we discussed things like, but my father was both athletic and philosophical. And he said, well, you found, you know, variations of the same thinking, you know, that it's there, you know. And then, um, um, let's see, be, even before I'd gone to Africa, because I didn't go until 1970, but I'd been to Mexico, I'd been to Canada, you know. Um, when I was 18, my aunt and uncle, I'd just gone to Los Angeles to live with them. I had no money. Uh, uh, I'll throw a, um, a pitch uh, on this program for free education, because oh. Los Angeles, uh, California was very enlightened and you could go to junior college uh, for $9 a semester. And that's how I, you know, I got through college. I would uh, say if there's anything we could do to improve the aesthetics of the world, <laughs> uh, you know, make education free through the university. And then people can, uh, more people will be able to contribute to the improvement of our lives, you know. Uh, now, that may seem idealistic to some people. It is idealistic, you know. We should have good ideals, mm -hmm. you know. Um, um, I went to Mexico. I learned from Mexico. Uh, uh, the way American society was, my street was a small one block dead end street. The children on that street, my age were either black or Mexican. And we functioned and played together thoroughly. I still remember Enrique and Angelina. And they would say, Melvi, Melvi, Andale, Andale, go home. Because I'm either playing at their house too much or they're at my house playing too much, you know. But the law would not let us go to school together because the law declared that they were white uh, for, for educational purposes, you know. So... You know, the world, I've seen a lot of changes in this world, you know. Um, and at the same time, I knew some of them had to come and many of them are not yet realized. Um, art is just a part of what we do. We hopefully, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I don't know, what we do should contribute to the improvement of humankind. Uh, and uh, why not, you know? Uh, I always think art is the level that we do it, you know. Yeah. I don't know if I got to all of your question, but... Yeah, and I mean, of course, many others come to mind. You know, in, in that same text, I think you, you speak about a, a positive world humanism, and I think that's what you just outlined. And then you say some things about museums that seem to sound like the things are being said about museums today. You know, you say museums are being criticized and picketed because of their inability to meet the real needs of the variety of cultures they pretend to represent. Mm -hmm. And uh, they seem, you know, they sound like words that are being written today. And uh, I, I want to go back to, a, I don't know if you have anything to add about this uh, particular statement, how you've seen also museum change and, um, and if you are pleased with those changes, but you, you were also very much involved, and, and that's my next question, into that change around 1970 and 71. So let me ask you first, do you see museums today being different? Do you see they are actually embracing uh, the values and, and the cultures they, uh, as you said back then, they pretend to represent, or you think uh, they can do better? Um, well, I know they can do better because it's a large problem. It's not a small one, you know. And, uh, you know, if we think of the origin of the development of museums, I mean, because there are histories related to that, you know. Um, um, one of them, for instance, everybody in the 20th century talked about uh, the influence of African art on Picasso and, you, you know, that whole generation and what it meant to the development of modern art. But that was because of uh, conquest and, and uh, colonialism. You know, uh, my name is Edwards, but I'm not from Wales, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and that means I, my name comes from the slave trade. And every other African-American that has an English or French or uh, any European name, you know, that's a reality. 
we speak, uh, all of us are now speaking in the English language, you know, and, but the world has many languages, you know, uh, um, um, we're aware of that, you know, but the museums, um, they've done more now recently, but they have a great deal to do. Um, I'll give you a, a, story, a quick one from my child or teenage years. Uh, there were three uh, Afro-American high schools in uh, Houston in the, uh, in the 50s, uh, evolving from one uh, right after slavery and then two added. And my parents went to the one that I went to, Phyllis Wheatley High School, which is named after the first uh, African-American poet uh, in the 1700s, uh, who was born in Africa and uh, learned English and then became very sophisticated and very expressive uh, in poetry. But in any case, um, um, they took two students, two art students, excuse me. <clears throat> they took two art students from each of the uh, three black high schools in Houston uh, to the museum on Mondays in the spring of 19, I think it was 53. And there was an art teacher, a young woman who was a graduate student at the University of Texas. Her name was Vera Jane Tate. Um, and, you know, she, she uh, was a teacher for our classes. The, the classes were nothing uh, unique and nothing we really hadn't already experienced, how to paint a still life, how to do this and that. But the great thing was spending, spending uh, those Monday afternoons running through the museum and looking at uh, Picasso or Wyatt, looking at something from the 16th century, laughing at the funny hat that somebody wore because that was what they wore in Rembrandt's time, you know, that kind of thing. But to really start to get the experience of art at that level. Now that wasn't an ordinary experience for us, you know. Um, and uh, at the same time in that period, my own father, uh, 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 after his own work hours, uh, sometimes modeled for art classes. I know because he brought home a couple of uh, drawings of himself. Well, he was uh, a beautiful physical specimen to tell the truth. Uh, so, you know, he, he uh, <laughs> the drawings came out good whether they were or not. <laughs> But what I'm getting at is, now that's Houston, a segregated city where you could, you had to drink at separate water fountains at the same time. And, uh, you know, it's a major American city, you know. Uh, okay, it's Houston's different now, you know, in many ways. But the dynamics and the power in Houston are still in the same hands. And the community I grew up in, uh, the real estate developers have had their eye on that area for years and because it's the dynamic area between downtown and the airport, you know. And so they're letting that area die and they are doing, and anybody can see it. And plus architecture in the South is made primarily of wood. So it's got about a 40, 50 year lifespan anyway, you know. So um, it's uh, museums in general, okay, the modern now collects more than they did. You know, it used to be when I went to uh, MoMA, the way Fredo Lam at the door was, uh, uh, the, the one called the jungle was about the only representative of uh, uh, an African from the Western hemisphere, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, they could have done better, you know. Uh, the, the, I, uh, the people who ran it and their dynamics were though typically American big city uh, you know, dynamics interactions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I remember when I, the year I moved to New York, 1967, a man who was on the board of the uh, modern and uh, named Campbell Wiley, uh, and he had just begun to be aware of my work and that I had moved to New York. And he said, look, there's something that's going to happen uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, we're going to try and develop a museum in Harlem. And of course that became the Studio Museum in Harlem a few years. And it's had a, a history of developing for the last 40 years. You know, I was a part of it. 
um, and William Williams, Sam Gilliam, Frank Bowling, and uh, you know, we were all in their earlier activities. William Williams, uh, the painter, gave the museum its real name, the studio part to that, you know. And uh, um, there were any number of positive ideas, you know. At the same time, you know, while we're discussing what's uh, the reality for Black artists in America or in New York uh, and the museums, uh, there were uh, artists uh, who were white, who were from various European backgrounds, you know, American backgrounds. And, um, you know, we learned lessons from them or we interacted and, and uh, shared things. You know, there was a fair amount of that uh, at the same time. But it's, it's still, as you can see from the dynamics of the world today, and since there's more um, visual in information, you know, people have cell phones in their hands and they can record history right in front of them and even affect history by using them. Well, uh, maybe the visual art of uh, documentation is, uh, you know, has its place. We know it does, you know, but uh, what I mean is uh, when the discussion of what's abstract and what's real, you know, well, imagination is, has to be there anyway. And then whatever you see, uh, you have to take it beyond what you've seen, or at least you hope to do that. And, uh, you know, that's what I've tried to do with uh, the work. Uh, I don't say I always succeed, but um, always, you know, that's the intention, you know. Um, uh, do you, I don't know if I'm interrupting you, sorry if I... No, uh, it's okay. Uh, do you have a, an ideal of, for museums? And I don't even know if you go around thinking about that, but <laughs> do you as an artist have an ideal museum, an existing one, or also an ideal of what museums should do? both for your work and for art and let's say for civic society. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I want to ask you about, you know, 1970 and the Whitney and all those mm -hmm. events that, that in a sense pointed to, to the state of museums in, in that moment in time. Certainly. Um, well, <clears throat> I don't know that I have a particular idea because um, given the variety of people, cultures, languages, and then, you know, the variety within individuals. So the potential for capacity, um, um, the, the potential for material is so broad, you, we'd be inventing uh, uh, museums, I guess, monthly in order to keep up with what, you know, all human beings do. But we can do better than we have done. That's the main thing. And with purpose. In other words, um, uh, there are museums of industry, museums, you know, of textiles, museums of this and that. And all of them are uh, worth having, in my opinion, you know. Um, and the art museums that come out of the people who come out of the art schools and out of art and that kind of thing, well, you know, uh, everything doesn't need to be in a museum. You know, my, I've, I had a uh, very opposite kind of uh, life, if you will. My first one man show was 1965 and was a museum show, it was a Santa Barbara museum. But a very enlightened man, uh, a museum director, Thomas Levitt, um, uh, saw my work, in fact, uh, two artists, uh, Richard Rubin and Arthur Secunda, had knew him and talked to him and told me I should take my work uh, up to Santa Barbara and show him. And it was right in the 1964, so the Lynch fragments were about a, a year underway. And um, um, I figured when he saw the work, he might like it. And he'd pat me on the back and say, good work, kid, keep it up, you know. Instead, he started talking about an exhibition. Well, I'd never had a gallery show. I'd never had anything. And in that period, we pretty much thought people had museum shows when they were 45 or 50 years old, you know, that kind of thing. So here I was a 26, 27 year old. Um, 
And I, I felt the work was good. That wasn't an issue with me, but I didn't have much of it yet, <laughs> you know. And, uh, 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 but uh, anyway, when he offered the exhibition and that was the summer of 64, and the show was going to be March of uh, 65, uh, you know, then in between my nine to five job, I had to uh, uh, stay busy, but I would have anyway, because it was, I was interested in that period. Um, I had, I mean, I had become intense, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, um, when the show happened um, and there was some good response, but I didn't have a gallery show. And this speaks more to the content of the American art world. I didn't have a gallery show till I was 50 years old. So, you know, you, 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 you figure it out, you know. Yeah. Um, I, and that was 1965. Um, uh, I moved to New York and it happened that the, uh, the museum in New York had been under pressure and they were, uh, and so I, I think it was, let's see, uh, November of 69, they did the exhibition of Alvin Loving, the painter. And then in March, uh, they had offered me the show then, Mac Doty. And uh, he had seen the lynch fragments and that's what he wanted me to show. But the other ideas I was developing because the lynch fragments weren't my only way of thinking, uh, but uh, uh, this body of linear uh, works, which were based on ge geometry, the one you're showing now, pyramid up, pyramid down, is a kind of optical twist based on uh, a reversal of forms from a quarter sections of quadrilateral pyramid, you know, but linear and using a linear material and given the history of art in that period talking about drawing in space in relation to Julio Gonzalez, uh, you know, and those developments. Well, here I was drawing in space with two different materials, poetically or politically or significantly loaded and they were barbed wire and chain. Mm -hmm. But what in terms of art, they allowed for different quality of line. And yet, the, uh, the geometry or geometric aspect of drawing is apparent, you know. And uh, anyway, what I'm trying to get at within this work is uh, sculpture and architecture can be uh, integral, you know. Uh, they can interrelate with each other. And um, anyway, I, th I was sure of it. Doty had wanted to show the lynch fragments and they didn't get shown um, in New York for several years. In this period, and this relates to your museum, Marcia Tucker was a curator at uh, the Whitney at the time. She was not the curator of my exhibition. And in fact, we met briefly, but she seemed to uh, move away, if you will, you know, uh, when I engaged her. But I just knew uh, she was a new person I was meeting. Mm -hmm. Three years later, we uh, were, were on a panel together at the Wadsworth Anthenaeum because of an exhibition of Sam Gilliam, William G. Williams and myself. And she confessed to me, she said, you know, when I met you at the Whitney, you just scared the shit out of me. And, uh, you know, and I said, well, what did I do? And she says, you didn't do anything, but you just, it just felt like I should be afraid of you. You know, and I laughed, you know, and, and we both laughed. And it turned out we were neighbors uh, living not far from each other in lower Manhattan. And through the years, we were uh, very good friends. And as she uh, developed the new museum and that idea, I was at a few meetings at her place uh, um, discussing uh, aspects of what they could do and not do. Uh, so, uh, uh, my notion is the Studio Museum was new. The Bronx Museum started to develop, you know, um, that there have to be more museums uh, uh, expressing, if you will, the dynamics of uh, more variety in communities, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And uh, I realize museums are not uh, 
easily economic entities to develop. But I just think they're a part of culture, you know. Uh, and the, uh, the photograph my father took of me when I was 16 years old and uh, at home, and it's with a still life that I had actually painted at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston and stuff. And I had on my football letterman sweater. Well, I was a student, I was a boy, I was a young man, you know. Um, I can look back and understand the, uh, the hopes and uh, aspirations of a young person. And I can look back at it, <laughs> at it as a, what, what am I now, an octogenarian? Something like that, <laughs> anyway. But you know, what I'm getting at is, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, to make art was what I set out to do. And I still uh, like being involved and doing things. And I have um, lots more ideas. So just keep trying, you know. <laughs> And that's what the museums are for occasionally to uh, say, well, he's not doing so bad. Let's take a look at it now. You know. There is a, a, an interesting quote by David Hammonds who, you know, speaking of looking back and, and, and museums having an in, impact on people that he visited your show at the Whitney Museum and, uh, and he said the show really impressed him and he couldn't believe what he saw because he didn't think you could make abstract art with a message. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, first of all, that's a, a, a very, you know, to me when making shows, I always wonder, is there going to be a 15 year old kid or girl in there who goes on to become David Emmons or, or Bruce Nauman or Melvin Edwards? And, you know, it's you know, one of the reasons why we do what we do. Um, and, uh, and I'm curious specifically this comment by David Amos, not that you made abstract art with a message. Uh, we already spoke about the choice of the barbed wire and the chains. Uh, you surprised me last time saying that it was less about a history of oppression and more actually the chain being the most common uh, device and tool no, in, uh, in humanity. I think that's how you described it last time. Yeah, well, that was... Um... When you think of why were chains invented, uh, they weren't invented, invented for slavery, not at all. They were, but they could be used for that once they were invented. But really, they were an improvement on, uh, shall we say, ropes or ways to tie things or hold things uh, in place. You know, and human beings had been doing that with fiber, uh, you know, and textiles, you know, all kinds of material for thousands of years. Somewhere in there in the metallurgy, the traditional blacksmith in the world figured out uh, that uh, you could make something that would function that way, but uh, was uh, made out of metal. And, uh, uh, you know, we have the, the metaphorical statement, a person is as weak uh, or a society is as weak as it's, uh, weakest link, you know, it only takes one link to break a chain. Well, it only takes uh, one whack of the sword to cut the Gordian knot, you know, or any of those uh, metaphoric interpretations. But the reality is barbed wire was created to keep the cows at home, uh, not to create concentration camps you know, but uh, concentration camps for humans, they, it always was concentration camps for animals, you know, but uh, first uh, barbar was used on the Native Americans for reservations and then used uh, against the Herrera people in uh, Africa in um, uh, the, I guess, 1910, 11 or 12. And then of course in, in uh, Europe during the uh, Second World War, you know. Well, it's uh, at the same time, uh, it keeps people out of people's backyards and from climbing fences and things like that. Human beings have a lot of imagination with anything that's been created, invented. Mm -hmm. And the reason uh, something is invented is not the limit uh, when it comes to why it's used. You know, we, we created atomic energy 
and killed many, many people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the same time, uh, uh, radia radia radiation is used uh, to uh, cure cancer, you know, and things like that. So it, it's a case of human beings using their better thinking. Uh, um, and if they do, they'll make better use of all of our inventions, you know. You know, uh, part of the lesson uh, personally for me is uh, we know in my family, one of the ancestors was a young adult uh, African uh, who had been trained as a blacksmith in Africa, ended up in slavery in the United States, um, lived to be 106 years of age, living through slavery and into the early uh, 20th century in Alabama, you know. Uh, only thing we don't know is what people, particular people he comes from in West Africa. But we know that metal work was what he did in the time of slavery. And, uh, but he learned it in Africa, you mm -hmm. know. So the transportation of people meant the transportation of technologies. And people don't tend to think of that in relation to Africa, you know, but that's, uh, that's a common actuality in all of the countries in the Americas, you know. I don't know. You say that, you say that actually your effort in sculpture had to be as intense as injustice in the reverse. Do you still subscribe to? Absolutely. Mission? Well, I'm, in, in that case, I'm talking about power and effort. You yeah. Know? And uh, if a society can create uh, an atomic bomb, it should be able to be as explosive in the direction of good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, often the scales of justice are, uh, you know, weighted in a direction I don't prefer, but, uh, uh, you know, in order to go forward, one foot has to be behind. <laughs> Can we spend a little more time about those two crucial years at the Whitney, if you still have, you know, oh, if yeah. you're not bored or... Uh, so in 1970, you take part in the annual, uh, which mm -hmm. is the equivalent today of the biennial, uh, mm -hmm. with a piece called uh, Homage to Coco. And who was Coco? And maybe we can see a picture. Coco is my grandmother. Her, name, name. her real name uh, is Cora. And um, uh, the reason um, for the piece, um, I had um, um, uh, an interest in the possibility of kinetic sculpture. I had seen Calder's and uh, actually in 1965 in Los Angeles, um, um, Jacques Tingley's work was uh, uh, there was a significant body of it owned by Duan Gallery that he had left uh, not completed uh, in the sense of motor attachment and that sort of thing. So um, my neighbor, Ronald Miyashiro, the sculptor who lived next door, worked for Duan Gallery, and he told them that I could, I could take care of it and stuff. Oh. <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, what he didn't know was my mechanical ability when it came to machines was I had been able to fix my bicycle, but that was about it. I was not, <laughs> <laughs> but I took up the challenge and worked with the um, Tingleys uh, and there were about 20 of them. And uh, basically they were complete uh, without uh, the attachment of the uh, um, uh, electrical foot switch. And, uh, and he'd left a box of those. So I basically connected them, cleaned them up. There were a few that clearly needed uh, some slight alterations so that the, the motions could happen. But uh, I did the show somewhere in my old photographs. I have a photograph of my uh, little year, year and a half old daughter stepping on the foot pedal and looking at the tinglys in amazement in, uh, <laughs> in the garage behind uh, my house. But Coco, um, her name was Cora Ann Nickerson by birth and Cora Ann Edwards and then, uh, and then Nick, uh, what is it, Anderson. But anyway, 
Uh, I couldn't pronounce the word Cora when I was a baby. And I ended up saying Coco. And she, uh, it became her name for everybody. Everybody called her that the rest of her life, uh, you know. And recently, in talking to a friend of mine from uh, the Congo, uh, he told me that the word Coco in his language uh, in the Congo region, Coco meant grandmother. So it was perfect, you know, <laughs> but I didn't find it out until <laughs> 80 years later, you know. But the rocker, when I considered either motorizing or mobiles like uh, Calder, uh, uh, I decided there had to be something else. And I remembered the rocking chair because she had two chairs, uh, the kind we call the mission rockers. They're made out of mission chairs. They're made out of uh, oak and they're very geometric. And usually they come in pairs, one which will rock and one which will not. And that was in my house from when I was a baby. And I used to take the rocking one and turn it over and play with it, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, somehow that possibility of investigating balance uh, uh, gave me an idea this way. And then the, the forms themselves, the addition of the chain, the original drawing, I had barbed wire going from side to side. But um, after I, constructed the frame, the, the heavy parts, um, uh, I decided that the barbed wire wasn't strong enough uh, visually and the chain. And then once I had attached the chain uh, and moved the piece, it, I realized I had an extra uh, aspect. Because the chain is flexible, its gravity lags behind the pendulum movement of the rocker. So it, it, uh, it affects the rocking motion in a way that was unexpected, you know. And so that uh, pushed me to uh, making any mini rockers uh, and depending on where you place the weight, uh, it gives them different, uh, you know, appearances and if you rock four or five of them at the same time, even though the rocker element is the same, uh, they, they rock at different speeds mm -hmm. because of the weight, the balance, you know, that kind of thing. And so it turns out if you had a room of a dozen of these and you started them to rock at the same time, they would finish, but at different times, you know, and, you know, it's a, interesting kind of phenomena, but uh, you learn things from trying things, <laughs> you see. And uh, my grandmother, by the way, was uh, an exceptional maker of quilts. And we all slept, you know, we didn't, quilts weren't bought from the store. They were grandma's quilts, you know. My mother was a fine seamstress, but she didn't make uh, quilts, you know. But my grandmother, yes, she did. And, uh, you know. So uh, in a sense, nowadays that's common to refer to quilts, and, you know, stuff like that, or to the, the home skills uh, that exist, you know, in society. And of course, American society has so many different cultures to draw on. There are all kinds of possibilities that are still there uh, within the complex of cultures, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I do have to ask you this, and then maybe we can open up to, to the audience, but, I, and I also don't want to stop too soon this conversation, but I do have to ask you about the following show in 1971 at the Whitney Museum. So in a couple of years, the Whitney Museum is very much part of your world. It, it's also a moment in which there are protests around the 1970 annual because of the lack of inclusion of uh, uh, black artists and, and black women. Um, and, uh, and in 1971, the museum is uh, meant to inaugurate a show called Black Artists in America, curated by uh, the same curator of your first uh, show. Um, mm -hmm. And what happens at that point? What goes wrong? You, you, you are among the ones that 
famously withdraw from that exhibition. I'm sure you've spoken a lot about it. I don't know if you care speaking about it. No, it's, it's, uh, uh, it was, uh, for me, it was very simple. Um, as I told uh, Mac Doty, that was the curator. No, no, I appreciated his uh, interest in my, my work and, you know, and, and his treatment of it uh, when it had been shown. Um, but um, what I was seeing uh, um, in his approach to curating, um, he was picking, if you will, lesser quality than was available. Not always, you know, because, uh, you know, there were uh, any number of fine artists in, in that exhibition. Um, and I have no criticism of artists who participated. But I felt, for instance, I'll give you one example. Uh, if you know the work of Ed Clark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ed Clark's, uh, nobody was painting with that quality. And he was a part of that post-war generation, a first, you know. I mean, a first in anything in American abstract painting in that period. And um, Doty dismissed him, his work, and then he included uh, some, uh, I don't remember the name and I've never heard it since, but some graduate student artist, you know, everybody was black, it was about black. And um, uh, as far as uh, the exhibition, and I just felt that that kind of decision-making wasn't positive and I didn't want to support it. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to uh, a few others who were yeah, having the same kind of feelings. I was the one who wrote out the expression about it, but the truth is I wasn't the only one who felt that way, you know. Um, uh, as far as the women's part, I think Faith Ringgold and uh, those people, and also there had been an earlier protest against, I guess it was the Metropolitan, and I wasn't quite in New York yet, so I wasn't really a privy uh, to that dynamic, you know. But this one I was. And, uh, you know, in, in one sense, I was sorry to have gone against uh, this person who had uh, treated my work uh, very well. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I had some principles that uh, I felt I, I had to deal with and I didn't, and I don't think they were just my own. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing because it wasn't just about me, you know, at all. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, any number of changes happen gradually in different places, different times and different people. And uh, all of us have had arguments and uh, fights, you know, and the art world's full of them. Um, um, <laughs> New York art bars were famous for scuffles and fights between people. Well, when I arrived, I says, I can't do that. I can't be a part of that. I didn't mean that I was too nice. I meant where, where not at all. I, but what I meant was where I grew up, men didn't fight in bars because somebody usually died. You know, they didn't, they didn't the kind of entertainment, my buddy got drunk, that, that was a different world. And so, my, my uh, how do you say, it? my ideas of, I didn't want things to go those kind of ways. Most yeah. times they didn't in New York, but you know, I already had my, how do you call it? Uh, I'd already developed uh, an aversion, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, but, um, um, and I didn't feel bad that I wasn't in the show. And the funny thing was I remember, uh, criticism of uh, some of the artists because they were abstract and some because they were this or that from our community. And the truth is uh, there were a lot of things that uh, hadn't been worked out and understood, you know, by a lot of people in a lot of directions, you know. Um, a lot more is understood and there's still more to do, but much more is understood, you know, is understandably undertaken now than it was then that's you know that's that's very clear uh, yeah. uh, you know um, I don't know uh, 
I, I could, you know, th these are the kind of questions you could discuss because they're little examples here and there. The Black Arts Movement, uh, uh, somebody asked me about that a, a few years ago in relation to one, a retrospective of my work. And I said, well, when you say black arts movement, rhetorically, you're talking about African-Americans. I said, but if you take that term uh, to a, a philosophical and historical depth, art has been made by, you mean Af art by African peoples, plural. That is, you know, all over the world. We're Africans in America, okay. Uh, Africans have made all kinds of art. You know, if there's anything that all of the bringing out of African art to the West is shown is there's every kind of thing that you can imagine has been made. Every kind of style from the simplest to the most complicated, from the most profane to, to the most sacred. You know, every uh, material you can think of has been used and, you know, a, a way for it has been found. Mm -hmm. You know, it just takes uh, another 200 years to get all of the writers and uh, uh, curators and, <laughs> you know, the people who, who analyze what we do while we've moved on as artists. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think hey, that's more your job, not mine. <laughs> well, but in a in an act of self criticism, <laughs> given the context, I think I should give up, open the floor to the audience. I think that's the lesson <laughs> to learn there, and, and to the artist. And let's see if there is any question, and and then maybe we look at a little bit also at some of your uh, uh, public works because. You also recently just inaugurated a show at City Hall uh, where actually homage to Coco is featured and, and other words. So let's see if there are questions from the people at home, as they say on TV shows. Um, there are a couple. Let me see. Uh, well, somebody says to give him a call and uh, left a phone number, but I don't know if I can <laughs> recite that. We'll send it over in an email. Uh, Somebody else is mentioning the show uh, at the City Hall Park, which will be open until November 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see if there is another question. Um, well, uh, one question is, how did you navigate the pressure of maintaining a course for your work within a context where other Black artists and intellectuals might have position abstraction and related practices as quote unquote white and escaping the responsibility towards your own community. I don't know if um, you, um, we touched upon that, but. Um, yeah, and well, what I would say though, for people who say that, you know, that uh, an individual is an individual, you know, and when Charlie Parker was creating his music, there were people from the black community who didn't like music that complicated, that dynamic, <laughs> that newly creative, you know. Um, and uh, uh, I have no answer for people uh, who have that question, except to say, I made what I wanted to make. I tried to do what I tried to do. And um, well, I can't use the language that uh, I grew up with, <laughs> which you know, and I don't really mean to, to uh, insult anybody, but they have to understand um, uh, we are millions with millions of possibilities, possible ways of inventing things. And to say that my community uh, would ask differently of me is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I never had I never lacked support from my community. I did have people who didn't care for the kind of work I did, but today I don't, uh, you, you can never live uh, and be a person and be absolutely in tune with every organization that claims it is in charge of ideas, you know? And, um, um, you know, the black community is too complicated and too broad uh, to presume 
that there's only one or two or three ways of thinking about music, about art, about poetry, you know, about medicine, about anything, mm -hmm. you know. And I think when when people try to apply that kind of pressure, uh, uh, I, often it was why I didn't join organizations because they seemed too naive to me. Mm -hmm. And I felt that uh, as a very young adult, you know, was that there were a lot of people that were making mistakes that I could see. I don't say I was perfect, but I was entitled to make my own mistakes if they were to be, you know. And I presume if I'm entitled to that, the way Jack Whitten worked, the way William Williams worked, the way Charles White worked, you know, or the way John Biggers worked, uh, you know, Jacob Lawrence, you know, all of those older uh, and more experienced, Elizabeth Catlett, you know, all of them, uh, we had mutual respect, you know. Uh, after I'd had my retrospective at the Newberger Museum and I ran into uh, Jacob Lawrence and here's a person who I'd respected his work since I was in high school. And, uh, and he was complimenting me on that and congratulating me, you know. And Romare Bearden and Norman Lewis, they became friends, you know. They were another generation, you know. And all of them were stylistically different, you know. They, they were creative individuals, you know. And so uh, um, the notion that anybody thinks they can speak for the African-American community and tell you which way to walk or dance or make art, they're off base. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a, a couple of very interesting questions. One is if you can speak a bit more about your time in, uh, in different African countries, and maybe you can tell us also about works you've made there because you, you made also public works, important works. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, every place I went, somebody asked me which place is my favorite. And I said, you know, it, 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 it's like having seven children and saying, which one is your favorite? You, you know, or, you know, uh, in, of your grandmothers or grandfathers, which one is your favorite? Each one has something, uh, you know, for you and you get something from, you know, each of them, if you uh, take the time to think and understand, you know. But uh, Nigeria, uh, I probably spent the most time in the earlier years, uh, Nigeria and Ghana, because they were English speaking. And so, you know, that was the uh, easier connection. Also, they were both vital. I mean, uh, one of the first persons to befriend me on my first trip um, was, which was the first country, was a four country trip of educators. And it was, uh, the first stop was Ghana. And uh, on that trip, I met Nana Ose Bonsu. Uh, he was the carver for the Asantehini, which is the king of the Ashanti people uh, in, in uh, Kumasi in Ghana. And uh, someone told me I uh, needed to meet him and they got us together. And he was my father's age. And he was a, uh, carving was his profession. He was a great carver. He was the grandson of a king or the, uh, um, um, we call it Ashantahini is what they call the king of uh, the Ashanti people. And he had the same name as that grandfather who was a king. But as he said, the way they work out kingship there, if you're the son or grandson of a king, you go out of the line of secession, not in the line of secession. It, it, they, it, it both switches uh, families, and it goes to the matrilineal side, not the, uh, the, the male side in inheritance. So by the time he was a young man, he needed to look for a job. <laughs> and, he, and he got trained as a, a carver or sculptor. And he was a very profound person, knew the history and the culture very well, and uh, took me to meet one of the casters of gold weights since, uh, 
um, I was one who worked with metals and um, um, gave me a set of uh, carving tools, even though he knew I wasn't a carver. And to this day, I have them in a box still sharpened by him. And uh, I'm not a carver, <laughs> but I'm not about to give them up. You know, maybe I'll, I'll find the time and circumstance. But um, uh, there were modern artists there at the University of Science and Technology. Uh, uh, there produced uh, any number of artists. And in fact, uh, one of them uh, who came to the United States uh, and worked as an assistant for me, his name is Bright Bimpong. And uh, uh, he went to that University of Science and Technology and a very fine young sculptor. Well, he, he's uh, uh, a very experienced man now, you know, and, and uh, um, there were any number of artists. I met more uh, contemporary artists in Nigeria than any other place. I think it's a, both a larger country and the emphasis uh, was uh, very much there, you know. And uh, um, it just uh, of the self-taught ones, Twin 7-7 seven, seven, uh, is a name many people will know, uh, you, you know, but uh, an architect like Demas and Woko, they'd have to look for, you know, more. Uh, Bruce Onabrakpea, one of the uh, painter printmakers, and by now, these are all the elders in art in Nigeria. And many of the next generation or two of Nigerian artists have gone to London and are, uh, uh, you, you know, have become artists in Europe, in other words, uh, that sort of thing. Um, let's see, uh, uh, Suleiman Keita in Senegal. In fact, uh, the reason I have a, a house and a place to be in Senegal is because we met in the uh, late 70s. He came here for an exhibition and then uh, we got to be friends and promised each other that someday we'd do something together if we ever had any money. And uh, there came a time when I had just sold a piece of sculpture and said, let's see if what I can do. Uh, I thought I was going to do it in Ghana, but I ran into Suleiman in, <laughs> again in uh, Senegal, and uh, uh, we agreed uh, in, on a project which involved some land. I actually built a small house uh, and uh, raised two tons of peanuts, you know. <laughs> I wasn't there doing the farming. That, that was the local village people actually doing the farming. But what I'm getting at is, you no, know, an artist can live in those countries. Um, one artist, another artist from Senegal, Abdullah Ndoy, who's, uh, uh, he's finished teaching, but they've just opened a new gallery in Dakar. And, uh, uh, you know, it's because the venues for contemporary art are limited. And one of the things uh, in our discussions in several African countries is the need for museums of contemporary art because museums are being built, but they tend to be comprehensive museums, you know, everything from natural science to uh, anatomy, but, um, uh, but specifically contemporary art for the living generation of artists they, that's a need and they've expressed it. In terms of a larger public piece uh, that was a, gave me good feeling. I made a variation of the column of memory or column of chain, if you will, that I've made um, and uh, gave it to the uh, city of St. Louis, Senegal, which is in the north of Dakar. And uh, in response to that, uh, uh, they made uh, uh, us honorary citizens of, uh, of uh, Senegal, of San Louis, you know. Um, I worked two summers in Zimbabwe, and which is a long way away, you know, from uh, uh, the countries to the north. And uh, that was a very interesting and good experience. The modern stone carving 
culture that's developed in Zimbabwe is a totally modern in their own uh, approach to things because traditionally they didn't carve stone uh, as art or ritual or that kind of thing. Uh, it's a, a contemporary development. So it has influence from what they've seen in magazines. It has influence from the traditional stories and forms. And so you see an incredible, in the West you would have said, well, they're, they're just gone surrealist haywire. They, they you know, but it's in three-dimensional concepts of form that a, a Henry Moore or somebody, uh, they don't look like that. But what I mean is they have that same set of skills and sensibilities in terms of form, you know, but they deal with their historical um, folk tales or legends, you know, stories and turn them into sculpture, you know. Um, the ones from South Africa, there was one named Dumile Fini who lived in the United States because he was in exile all of those years of apartheid. And he, he first came out to England and then uh, moved to the United States and worked under very difficult circumstances because a real income was hard for him to come by. But he made very interesting sculpture and um, real tragic ending in the sense that the day the things had just changed and the day he got his visa to go home to South Africa, he went to a record store. We were waiting for him at a poetry reading. He had a heart attack in the record store and passed away. But since his death, uh, they've taken up his case in South Africa. That is the interest in his work. And so my understanding is they've done uh, major things with his work, you know, but here's a man who lived, uh, you know, a good 30 years in exile, didn't get to see his family or any of that all of that time because of uh, uh, racism. So, but it's ending uh, is a vindication of sorts, you know, for, for, you know, him. And hopefully the next generation of uh, young artists in South Africa, uh, uh, you know, will have a much better chance and opportunity. As a matter of fact, the first exhibition that was done international after uh, South that things changed in South Africa, Okwe was the uh, uh, person who was in charge of it. Uh, because on the one visit that I made in that period, uh, somebody said I should meet this man from Nigeria who's going to do it. <laughs> and we got to say hello to each other, you know, and that sort of thing, you know. So, and there are always intersections uh, in relation to life in the art world. You meet people, uh, uh, you have good friends, and then you don't see them for years for you know one reason or another. Uh, but I would say if you want an interesting life, I will say this part, which is, I don't know where it fits, but if you want an interesting life, trying to be an artist is a good way to see humanity and understand it. Mm -hmm. And it's not all good and it's not all bad, but it's, uh, it's a challenge worth uh, dealing with, you know, at least from my part, you know. Well, I think that that is probably a great ending unless you want to add something. You said earlier that uh, people say a picture is worth uh, 1,000 words and a sculpture is worth 2,000, but uh, <laughs> you certainly had uh, so many words for us tonight. So we, we are incredibly grateful and we could probably continue with many other questions, but you've been so generous and we, we are incredibly thankful. So, Well, my pleasure and I uh, thank you. I wish uh, the new museum uh, many more, you know, I hope it always stays new. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we hope to see each other in person soon and, and celebrate this wonderful show that exactly that... I mentioned grappa I think you know what that is <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much Melvin this was amazing and uh, I hope we can continue the conversation another time okay Massimiliano thank you take care Ciao,